Hello everybody, Chris Van Meter here, uh, along with Jeff Hoagland. We're bringing you the last installment in our Hex Shards of Fate Primal Dawn set review. We've gone ahead and gone over the five shards, and now we're going to go over the artifacts, the multi-shard cards, the resources, and the champions. So this video is going to be a little bit longer than the other ones, since we have quite a bit to go over. We hope you bear with us through, uh, through the entire thing. But let's start with Blood Infusion Device. So it's a one-cost artifact and part of a cycle, so there's one for each shard. This enters play, you gain a blood threshold and a charge. So it's similar to playing a shard, you just don't get the resources. Uh, basic, if you have two blood thresholds, you can pay three, sack it, it deals three to each opposing champion, and you gain health equal to the damage dealt this way. So there's a lot of text here. Yeah, and uh, one of the reasons I'm excited about this is, again, this is a cycle of infusion devices, one for each shard, is the fixing for multi-shard decks so far in Hex has been a little bit lacking. Like, the infusion devices I've had previously aren't aren't stellar, but the fact that this one, these ones give charges to is big. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I do like that there's a little bit of a restriction to, like, if you play this by itself it's not going to enable the ability on it because you have to have two blood threshold uh, so you know you are going to want to be playing these in decks while you're having you know blood shards in your deck uh, but there are a lot of deck there are a lot of cards that either do something based off of the number of different thresholds you have or even trigger when you gain a specific threshold um, so like these cards are going to have a lot of potential there plus they all cost one, and there was that four cost three four that puts a one cost artifact from your graveyard into play. That's also a common in the set, and I think that's going to be a very popular limited archetype. Yeah, definitely. Like you know, tacking on deal three gain three to that is not unreasonable. Yeah. On top of gaining a charge. Yeah, man. It's the fact that these gain a charge make me real interested in them. Like. Champion powers are some of the most powerful things you can do in this game, like generating resources without having to use, like generating things without having to use your resources are just very powerful. So like, yep, you know, yeah, this, I think, I think I'm going to keep my eye on these and just try them out in like random spots to see, to see how they play. And you can shuffle them back in with Winter Moon. Right, here's Broombot, and this is one of my favorite cards, flavor-wise. So it's a two-cost, two-one artifact troop robot, and it enters play exhausted. So much like me, whenever I have to sweep, it's going to enter play exhausted. This is, we need another two-cost sweeper, right? That's yes, this is. a two-cost sweeper. Flavor off the charts, not going to play um. it in my deck. Um, I mean, this. let's be honest, this is a nerf restop bot. Yep. So, and here we have a Bumble bot. Just a one, yep. two cost, one, one flight speed. Uh, this one's a bit more playable because it has, you know, speed and, fl and some evasion. But these are more, these are, these more, are more, more nerf reese cards. Yep, they're just adding ticks to the miss, the miss category on your reese hits. So here we have Coins of Kismet, and this is one of the most interesting cards in the set. It's a three-cost artifact, and you pay one and exhaust it to create a random Coin of Kismet and put it into your hand. Now there are just like, I think there's like ten different coins. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Uh, one, yeah, two, one, two, three, three, three four, four, five, five six, six, seven, eight, seven, eight nine. So there's nine different coins, and they all do different things, but here's an example. So they all cost zero. When they enter your hand, you play it for free. And when they enter play, they do something, and then they're just voided. So it's always going to give you a random something. So this one gains you a charge. There's one that gains you a permanent resource. There's one that gains you a random threshold. There's one that draws a card. You know, it's strange to me that they went through the trouble of creating and getting artwork for nine, nine cards for this. It's almost just like they didn't want to put all of this possible text in a text box. On the card? Yeah, so it's just like, you know, you use it and, like, one of these things happens. 
Yeah, basically, because you know you play it for free right away, and then it gets voided. So like, it's just it's just gone. Yeah, so like it's not it even in your crypt. Yeah, I don't. I think this is. I don't. I don't ever see myself playing this in constructed, but I think this is a sweet card in limited. Just you get you get something. Yeah, anything that like lets you use your extra resources and creates even a possible small advantage seems fine. Yep. All right, here we have Crucible of Morvarth. One cost, uh, exhaust to void a random card in opposing crypt. Two sack it, void all cards and all crypts. Gain two charges. So this is Winter Relic Moon. Relic of Winter Moon hate Relic of Progenitus. Gaining two charges is huge. Yeah, I'm, I'm I am mean, excited to play this in a Tetsot deck. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, I do think that this is just reserves material. Because, again, you don't always want this effect against everyone, and the fact that it doesn't hand trip like a relic does means that it's slightly less powerful. Well, so, here's a way to look at it. If you're playing a deck like Tetsot, right? When this is good, so when it's relevant, say, against Winter Moon, it's going to be very, very good at shutting off some of their things. And when it's not good... It's, you know, like a third of an element. Uh, yeah, a third of an elemental. Like, is, is that good enough to play in the main? I, I don't think so. I feel like I feel like it depends on the context of the format, I guess. Um, you know, I think you, this effect would have to be good, I would say, probably against half of the decks you're expecting to play against in order to be reasonably main deckable. Fair. Yeah. I feel like if... Dance Macabre is a big part of the format, then this is 100% main deckable. That yeah, yeah, like I said, I, I agree that I think if it's if it's good against half or more of your opponents, you can probably just play you know at least two of these in your main deck. Yeah, well, I'm definitely going to get a set of them as soon as the set comes out on Tuesday. <laughs> Alright, Diamond Infusion Device. So here's the Diamond one, uh, and you just get to revert a card. kind of feel like that's worse than deal three gain three to a, a champion <laughs> yeah i guess i guess it depends it, i mean if you're in limited this could be good with the necrotic things that you have depending on what you're shipping on and stuff like that yeah yeah i mean they're i think they're all going to be playable just the fact they give you a charge yeah, definitely. Uh, here we got e Eagle Claw Orb, a one cost, Sockable Miner, basic to sack it, target tribute you control, or in your hand gets all socketed powers of this. Not constructed playable? Do you think this is limited playable? I don't think so. The extra, like, spending a card to give something an upgrade, so it's definitely card disadvantage. Yeah, I feel like... The only time I'm, I'm ever going to play this is in a deck in limited with uh, the guy that rebuys one cost artifacts, because then I can like use this to give it destruction or speed in my hand, and then play it and rebuy it to be able to give another one destruction okay. or speed. But that's, that's like fair. that's like the only time I can see myself playing that card. This card in their hand is going to see a lot of play in limited. Three cost two two troop when it enters play. Gain a threshold of your choice. Just great fixing. Okay, stats. Like, perfectly reasonable. Yeah, just gonna see play all around in limited. Maybe even in constructed if five shard decks become playable, but I doubt it. Here we have an interesting one Infinity Engine. So it enters play exhausted, four cost. Uh, you can exhaust it and exhaust one or more other cards you control, and you gain one temporary resource for each other card exhausted this way. So, this is actually kind of like Cryptolith rights, right? Like, you yeah. basically turn all of your idiots in play into into ramp. Yeah, but it also it just it affects other cards. So if you have just like a bunch of cogs, infusion devices, you can use those for resources too. Okay, it, and if you have a bunch of constants in play, those can ramp you as well? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's interesting. I feel like... It's worse. I feel like this is just generally going to be worse than the four cost one that you can exhaust for two, two resources though. Hex engine. Yep. Yeah. 
Alright, here we have map spot. One cost, one one. Basic, and you pay four, it gets plus two attack, or you pay four and it gets plus two defense. Sell your Reese's now. I mean, what? <laughs> yeah, more more Reese nerf. But again, I think this is... I feel like this 3-4 four for 4 that rebuys 1 cost artifacts it's just it has the potential to be one of the most important cards in the limited archetypes. And it's a common, right? Yeah, it's a common. And it only has 1 ruby threshold, so like you can just use like the ruby infusion device to be able to play them. Even this, even this next card is like a five cost robot that isn't that good when you hit it with Reese. Uh, yeah. So it's a five cost three three. Uh, basic. You can pay one and create a bumble bot. Put it into play. This gets minus one minus one. When you gain a charge, it gets plus one plus one. So this is just like a really bad pentavis. Yep. It's kind of cool that it's a robot factory though. Okay, here we have Recoiler. It's a 3 cost, 3-3. Three, three. When it enters play, put another card you control into your hand. So you can rebuy things with, you know, come into play abilities, or if you don't have any other, any cards, um, you just get a 3-3 three, three for 3. But you can also you can use this to rebuy infusion devices to get more charges. You can use it to, to rebuy chance to get more triggers. How, how bad first robot your resets? Oh, if you, oh my god. Just, oh, oh, it's just, it's four for four, bad robots. <laughs> oh. That's, because, I mean, how many times is Reese the only thing on the table when it makes a oh, robot for the first a time, lot. right? I feel, I envision myself being in, like, an IQ top eight winning in and having that happen. My keyboard's going to get thrown at the wall. And having that happen and just... <laughs> I will run as fast as I can and just jump head first out my sliding glass door off the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we'll have a 3 3 at least, though, right? Gross. We got that going first. All right, here we have the Ruby Infusion device, and I feel like this one is probably the best one of them all. I completely agree. Just a one drop. And so you have double Ruby, you can pay one and sack it to give a true plus one plus one speed, and it's permanent. Like it's not you don't even and you don't even have to pay three like the other ones. Like this is just you pay one, sack it, troop gets plus one plus one in speed. That seems great. The it, sapphire one we have up next here isn't uh, terrible either. Yeah, we have the sapphire one. Uh, you can pay two, and a troop gets minus two, minus two attack. Yeah, this one seems fine too. I think I think it's worse than like Sapper's Charge, but I mean this this deals with Vampire Princess. It does deal with Vampire Princess. That's true. Hmm. So again, context of the format definitely matters a lot. So yeah, it also it, it also deals with uh, Anarchist as well. Yep. Yeah, this card's pretty sweet. And provides fixing and a charge. Man, all these infusion devices are nice. All right, here's here's a legendary robot. Let's see if it's good. Seven cost, scrap the endless. When it dies, you get a scrapyard magnetron. At the end of your turn, put a random non-unique junk from your crypt into play. So magnetron is the one that when it dies, you get like the two two twos that make one ones when they die. Yep. Yeah, I mean, so this, this is just. So this one isn't a isn't a blank with Reese. I won't be upset when I find this one. Yeah, it's just value bot. Yep. Sticky bot. All right, Sepultura Flesh Reaver. Six cost, three three artifact troop. It's a construct. If you have blood, it gets rage two, diamond steadfast, ruby swift strike, sapphire flight, wild plus one plus one. So if you have them all, it's got a lot of keywords. Yep. I feel like well, as long as you are enable for this to be playable. In constructed, I don't think this is ever going to be playable. I agree with that. Yep. Sorry. But Get in that out of the way. In again. limited, I think that I think that if you have any two that aren't blood diamond, I think blood diamond is the worst combination.
Yeah, I think if there's if blood sapphire ruby, if you got those three together, that's hot or even blood blood ruby together, like rage plus plus strike is really powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I'm definitely gonna play this in all of my limited decks. Like cause you're you're at least two colors, you know. Yep. Alright. Servo Servant. Three costs, artifact engine. At the start of your turn, gain one resource. And you can pay one and transform this into a battle bot. This gets at the end of turn rebirth this. What is a battle bot? Are these in the created cards down here? No, it's not. I don't see it on the search. Oh. Let's see what a battle bot is. But I don't have an image of a battle bot. Google doesn't seem to be telling me what it is either. Yeah, well, my guess is that it's. Well, war bots are 3 3. Battle bots yeah. less than that, so this is probably a 2 2. That's my guess. Card seems mediocre at best. Yep. Alright. Four costs. Shrine of Zindler Gash. It's a chaos touched artifact. At the start of your turn, sacrifice a card and draw a card. I'd be pretty surprised if this was constructed playable. Yeah, it just seems bad. You're probably just going to end up sacrificing itself to draw a card. Yep. Alright, Silver Rook. Two cost artifact. Two exhaust. Deal one damage to each opposing champion. Gain health equal to the damage dealt this way. So this turns on. Both the bloodthirst-like mechanic and the life gain mechanic. Yep. So context of your deck probably playable at uncommon. Yeah, and you can, and it's you know you can use it at quick speed. It's not basic, so you can if you have ones that are gaining permanent effects, you can get them on your turn and your opponent's turn. Yeah, yeah I like the room's bigger. So here we have spine spine scuttler, one cost one one. The start of your turn, if you have three or more different thresholds, this gets a permanent plus one plus one. Hmm. Probably not constructed playable. Like miserable top deck. Um, if you're playing, uh, you know, a multi or five shard deck, you're probably more controlling than you are aggressive. So you don't really want a one one for one anyway. Yeah, and it's like not going to be growing until like turn. Turn four, which, yep. is, which is slow, I think. Right. All right, here we have Tomb of Nolzon. It's a nine-cost artifact with minus one cost in all zones for each different threshold you have. So at best, it costs four. You can pay one exhaust and create a random troop with Nolzon in its name and put it into your hand. That seems a lot of work to draw a card. Yeah. Yeah, no thanks. And here we have twin eternities, so nine cost, basic action, create an eternal mender and put it into play, and an eternal scholar and put them put it into play. So these are two they're six sixes. And they just double things. So when it deals one of them when it deals damage to an opposing champion, you gain health equal to your health. And the other one when it deals damage to an opposing champion. You draw cards equal to the cards that are in your hand. Okay, so it's uh, nine resources for twelve power. Yeah, for two six sixes. Is that better? I I feel like this is probably really going to be better than ramping into like an Aborian Root Father with appropriate gems. So probably not extract playable. Yeah, now it is colorless, so you can play it in any deck. So decks that are accelerating have Aborian Root Father. Yeah, um, I really want to hit this with Indigo. Yep. Oh man, we could Indigo. Yeah. If you think you could ramp into it, you could double it up with the uh, 
Thunderfield Seer, right? Or Thunderfield Elder. Yeah. And then you just get four. It's big old. What's better than 12 power? 24 power, of course. Four eternals. Double your double. Yeah. I feel like this card is probably good enough to like just take in limited and try and build decks around surviving to it. Just play like 18 or even 19 shards. Yeah. I definitely want to play this when I have an Azure Fate in play with the Speed Gem. <laughs> yeah, it's just big and big and flashy. All right, and here we have the last artifact. It's a wild infusion device. So this one gives you a charge and a wild threshold, and then you can sacrifice it, and you just get a six cost five five crush. Completely reasonable. I like the fact that the, this has the biggest upside. It takes a little bit. It takes the most investment, but I like that it is an actual threat. Yeah. Hey, this is interesting, especially like if you combine it with uh, Cressida, uh, Cressida to to ramp into that smash it on. But if you're Alindra, like between this and Alindra, you have a lot of passive ways to create giant fatties. Yep. I like that they just all give you charges. I think all those infusion devices are playable. All right, here we have the multi shard decks. So here's going to be some splashy cards. So four cost, blood, diamond threshold, four three, flight, swift strike. Opposing troops are not healed at the end of each turn. So we enter Hearthstone mode for for your opponent's troops. Pretty much. Um, I mean. Worst case, this is just like a 4-3 flying swift strike for 4, which is great stats. Yeah, again, when these cards are hard to evaluate, you want to look at our, what are the rates like, and the rates are reasonable on her. And yeah. uh, I think her text is relevant. Snap first pick and draft. <laughs> I mean, like, the thing that's huge about this is, like, imagine you both have vampire princesses. You're not just bouncing off each other anymore. Yours are killing theirs after two hits. Yep. All right, here we have Bogberg the Great Gobbler. Sweet name. Six costs, yep. double ruby, double sapphire, two two flight. So stats wise, this is bad. But when it enters play, each champion discards their hand and draws seven cards. This gets plus two plus two permanently for each action drawn this way by both players. So statistically speaking, if your deck is reasonably optimal for this, this is an eight eight. Like like and, you gain, and you gain information on like how many actions your opponent just drew, which is like going to equate into ways to handle this this creature. Yep. And I like that this triggers when it enters play. So like if you, you know, find some way to reanimate it, you're just going to get the trigger. Everybody discards their hands. You draw a bunch more ways to reanimate other other troops. And it's just you know the bonus is permanent. So the second time it triggers, it's going to be huge. Probably one shot them. Yeah, this card is real interesting. I really want to find ways to reanimate this card. And I mean, like, I don't even or know like that. copy it with Face Taker after it gets big. I think you even need to do that. Anything that fancy with it, like just like the the Ruby Sapphire deck, you want to discard your Phoenixes and your actions to go with your Phoenixes. Like, it seems super reasonable. Just cast on six, or maybe the Phoenix decks even play Crimson Clarity. Sometimes you could accelerate into this card a little bit. Yeah. Because you're vomiting your hand out. I mean, there is, there is that one card that just like randomly turns into other things. One of them is just gives you six resources for four. Yeah, that seems great. Like play this card on turn four. Sounds wonderful, especially if you're like vomiting scorches and like scar inside of your hand. Seems really powerful. Yeah. Now, is it Let, letting our opponents draw seven could potentially be hazardous? Sure. So basically, you just want to make sure you're playing this in a deck where you always have less cards in your hand than they do. Yeah. Yeah, this card seems sweet. And it just becomes giant. Chrono Damon. Eight costs. Sapphire, Sapphire, Diamond, Diamond. 6-6 six, six Flight. When it enters play, you may void all other non-Avatar cards. When it leaves play, put each card voided by this into play. So it Oblivion Rings everything that's not an Avatar, if you want it to. 
I'd be really surprised if this one's constructed playable. The the stats are all right, but like the cost is prohibitive. The the shards are tough, and its effect is medium. Now, you can have this in your Rutherford Banks deck. Fair, I guess. You want to be able to reanimate a sweeper, kind of. Hmm. I do know that, like, Diamond Sapphire Rutherford Banks, like, is is a strategy. All I know is this is going to be a bomb unlimited. Yep, definitely. Anything that's got a these multi shard cards are like pretty hard to evaluate. All right, here we have Darmok. Uh, it's a seven cost, one of each threshold, seven seven flight. When you play a non resource card, create a random non resource card that does not share a shard with that card and put it into your hand. Actually, every card you play draws a card. Yeah. I, this seems great. If there's a, if there's a five shard deck worth playing, like this is this is the top end. I agree. <laughs> All right, flickering gobbler. I'm excited for this one. So it's a two cost diamond ruby threshold. That's a two two rage one flight speed. At the end of turn, if you played an action this turn, put this in your hand. Otherwise, sacrifice it. Yep, and again, like cards like this, you want to look at their their baseline, which the worst this card is. The worst this card is is two cost, hit your opponent for three. Yep. And it, that's not awful. And like if you're if you're playing Scorches, you could play this on turn two and hit them for three, and then on turn, you know, three hit them for four when you attack with it again. Yeah, I think this card has a lot of potential in those like the Phoenix style decks. Like I just want to be playing a bunch of actions anyway. Yep, definitely. And you could even just like, yeah, yeah. I, I think this card has that. That deck is going to change a bit, and it has a lot of potential. <laughs> oh, gobbler, gobble, gobble, gobble. This card's real interesting. So, Forever's Child. It's a five cost. The art on this is beautiful, by the way. Yep. It's, a, it's a five cost, four four, uh, double diamond, double wild, life drain. At the end of each turn, if you gained health this turn, create an orchin and put it into play. And the Orchin is a created card down here. Thought I saw them. Thought I saw them too. Yeah. Where did it go? It must be missing some when they pushed pushed everything back around on here. Yeah. Yeah, so Orchin is a two cost uh, Diamond Wild troop, zero, zero. And as it enters play, it gets plus one, plus one for each health you gain this turn. So you're you're literally making four fours every turn you attack with this. Yep. Like, hi, Erdnock, how do you beat this card? Yep. <laughs> like, it doesn't even have, just have to be Erdnock, like... If this card lives for a couple turns, you're just like gonna beat any almost any deck. Like I think this card has a lot of potential to be very, very good. Yep, it's a, it's a must answer on the spot or you're gonna need an extinction to clean up after it. Oh man. And the art suite. Avatar of Youth. We have Plant Abomination, Freak of Nature. It's a four cost two two. Uh, double wild double blood threshold. At the end of your turn, a random opposing troop gets minus one, minus one. At the start of your turn, if this is in your crypt, this gets a plus one, plus one. Uh, in basic, as long as you have double blood, double wild, while this is in your crypt, you can pay four health and put four other troops in your crypt into your deck and play this for free. So there's a lot of text on this card, but I think if there ends up being a blood, wild, like graveyard strategy deck, this card is going to be playable. Yeah, definitely. Like, it's just a straight value card that lets you consistently use your crypt over and over again to keep generating advantage. And while it's, like, even if you just, like, play it as a 2-2 uh, for 4, 
you're gonna get the minus one minus one trigger on your end step. So like you you can get value out of it just by playing it as a two two for four. Yep. <clears throat> Alright, up next we have Ghost Howler. Four cost, three four, diamond wild, steadfast. When you gain health, troops you control get plus one plus one this turn. I don't think this is good enough for constructive, but this seems very bomby and limited. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it just seems very good. Here we have Lassar Chul. So we've got a 5 cost, 5-5, five, five, Blood Ruby Threshold, Speed. When it enters play, each opposing troop gets, when this blocks, it gets minus 5, minus 5 this turn. This card seems pretty sweet. Yeah, it, uh, it definitely... So, it's a sweet design, but the problem with cards like this, I always feel like, is that their their cost slots them into an archetype that's not always interested in like the effect that they're providing like mm -hmm. this wants to go into an aggressive deck but an aggressive deck generally inter isn't interested in playing five drops i agree and it's weird that it's a venom warrior like i didn't realize there were venoms in the ruby shard correct yeah i think that's the first one we've seen of those she's quite busty too All sexy spider, huh? <laughs> Here we have Lightning Sky Hunter, six costs, diamond, sapphire, threshold, four four flight, quick troop. When it enters play, troops with flight you control get invincible this turn, and then you ready each troop with flight that you control. That that's a lot of things. It's almost Archangel Ivison. Almost. I think this card is probably pretty good actually. I don't know. It's a tough sell. Like, in Constructed... Oh, I think it's obviously good and limited. Like, yeah, it's just a bomb. It's like, a dragon. It's, it's, a, it's a removal spell that's that's also a threat. Um, in Constructed, like, you probably don't have a ton of flying troops, and, like, this is competing for things like, like Windsinger slot. It's competing for things like the 5-5 the five, five flight quick troop that makes your next card quick as well. So... I feel like this card gets outclassed by other cards that do similar things at similar costs. Yeah. I do like it how it just, like, if you're playing a deck with a bunch of aggressively slanted flyers, um, like, this is just another way to save your troops from extinction while progressing your board. Sure. Yeah. I guess if there ends up being, like, a blue-white flyers-type deck in constructed decks, it'll be playable. All right, so here we have Orochi Nico, three cost, diamond wild, three, three. This has plus one, plus one for each health you gain this turn. I mean, we talked about Watch Wolf probably not being playable earlier, so I'd be surprised if this is good enough. Yeah, not, not good enough in Constructed. Definitely will play in Limited in my green, white, or in my diamond wild uh, life gain deck. We have Pact Maker Heretic, five cost. Uh, wild Blood for a 4-4, four, four, and you can pay 3 and put a troop in your crypt into your deck and gain 3 health. Or you can pay 3 and void a troop in your crypt to draw a card. So I think this is stellar for limited, but I, yeah. I, I think first it just costs too much, right? Yeah, I was going to say, it, in order to generate value from this card, you need to play it on 8, which is just prohibitive. Yeah. Sorry, Packmaker Heretic. Right here we have Psionic Flame. So it's uh, 1xx Sapphire Ruby basic action. X damage, target champion or troop, draw X cards. So for 3, it's deal 1, draw 1. For 5, it's deal 2, draw 2. For 7, it becomes deal 3, draw 3. Is this good enough? I don't think this is good enough to see too much play. Again, this is another one of those. I feel like if they had pushed it a little bit and made it a quick action, it would be playable but not broken. But as a basic action, I feel like it's just nowhere near good enough. Yeah. Seems pretty sweet if you ever get to copy it with a Thunderfield Elder, though. Sure. I am going to play this in my limited decks, though. Just five costs, deal two, draw two is good enough. Here we have a real sweet card, Rotten Ranker. Five cost, blood wild, 
put target troop from your crypt into play, that troop battles target opposing troop. God, we turned something into a fight dino. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. This is just I... a snap first pick and limited, and if there becomes a reanimator style deck, uh, I think this card is in it. Yeah, I think this card's important for constructed just because like it's a fifth through eighth copy of Rise again. Like you don't even care about the the fight necessarily. Like just being able to play uh, eight reanimate spells is something you're looking for. Yep. All right, here we have Spellstone Gargoyle. Four costs, Wild Sapphire, one four, or Diamond Sapphire, one four, Flight. When a troop you control with Flight deals damage to opposing champion, this gets plus one attack. Uh, I don't think this is going to see any play in Constructed, but this is just a straight-up bomb in Limited. Yeah, I mean, it's self-enabling in Limited, and if you even have one other flyer that's connecting with it, it gets very large very quickly. And it's an uncommon, so you're definitely going to see them. All right, then the last multi-shard card we have is Whirling Brutalizer. Three costs, Blood Ruby, Speed... When this attacks, it deals 2 damage to each opposing champion or troop that was dealt damage this turn for a 3-2. So this is seems very good with the, the Pingar. Yep, definitely. Or the Rook. So this is something that you could. So uh, again, surprised if this seems to play in Constructed. At three, it's just not quite pushed enough for the base stats that it has, and you have to set up too much for its text to be relevant, I think, in Constructed. Yeah, although, I mean, three for a 3 two speed m might be good enough uh, if there are any, like, orc synergy cards. Like, I know there's one that, like, gives all of your orcs rage, which could be good enough. Um, but I think, I believe that sits on the same spot. It's a three cost 2-2. Two -two. Yep. Alright, so let's go ahead and look at our resources. So here we have Karloth Cobblestone. It's just a human trishard, diamond, or diamond, sapphire, ruby. Um, I really like these allegiance uh, resources. I think they're very good at pushing, pushing decks. Um, you know, just basically untapped dual lands. And I think that they're just all going to be very important in making it so that certain archetypes are playable. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to have to do um, another pass over and see, like, which all cards I'm looking at to play are human because it's important to remember that just because a card makes three different um, shards, if there's a just a diamond, diamond, ruby, or ruby, sapphire deck that has enough human, you could just play this as an additional dual shard in your two, two shard deck. Yeah. What do you think the number is on, on humans that you want to make this enabled for a dual shard deck? So, um, in the Blood Sapphire Venn deck that I, I, I worked on a lot when I first started playing, I think the, the lowest number that I was comfortable playing consistently is about 10, and you can even board down as low as, like, 6 and still see it pseudo-regularly. Pseudo I think, I'd have to check the hyper-geometric distribution offhand, but I think it's, like, 10 gives you, like, close to 90% to have it enabled within, like, your first uh, 8 or 9 cards. Fair enough. Next here we have is Monsaki Lilypad. Uh, it's the Shinhair Allegiance, so you can either get Blood, Wild, or create a Battle Hopper and put it into play. So here we have, you know, that enabler. You know, you can make these Battle Hoppers, have them die off in combat. They'll go to your crypt. And then you can use the, the cards that allow you to eat things out of your crypt. Plus the art on this card is really sweet. I like how the the shards, like the special shards, are like full art. They're pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. And like, you know, the battle hopper again fills up your, your crypt with extra things for the cards that, that, that matter. And it's a troop that triggers your rune ear hierophant. Uh I found, since we're talking about more of these shards, I did, pulled up the hypergeometric really quick. For those wondering, 10 of these uh, races in your deck gives you about an 80% chance of having them within your first 8 cards, which is fairly consistent. So. Yeah. I mean, I bet on less. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, here we have Quash Ridge Rubble. So this is the Orc Allegiance uh, Blood Ruby or a random orc you control, or in your hand, it gets rage one. So I think this card, if 
if there's if there's going to be an aggressive orc deck, uh, I think it's made possible because of how good this card is. Yeah, definitely. And like one of the things that I really felt when I was playing the the wild ruby deck is that you wanted to play more dual shards, but you didn't want to play more than two of the shards that don't make a temporary resource. So you know, an aggressive orc deck like this gets to play four of these plus one to two of the dual shard that doesn't make a temporary resource so six dual shards is is plenty to enable a two player aggressive deck generally the other thing i want to point out is like the mono ruby urknock decks are basically you know they're orc decks so like so they they like, might want to play four of them like, just like i'm them. just going to play this in my mono red deck you know, yep. like it's 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 an untapped resource they can give me red if i need it or can just you know pump one of my orcs, like Quashridge Tusker is an orc. Yep. And I mean, like the the mono ruby deck plays the the one drop that gets becomes a two two if you have another orc. So mm -hmm. and that's generally enabled in your deck. Yep. That card's sweet. All right, and here we have Screos Limestone. Uh, it's the Dwarf Allegiance. You get ruby sapphire. Or you get a worker bot, which is a 1-1 one, one defensive artifact. Which... Or a random robot if you have a recent play. Yeah, That's or, the important thing to remember. Is that or, or a random robot if you have a recent play. And Reese it's just like, yep. just like a dual land like you have in the uh, uh, like the Azure Cannon deck. You have like, what, four, seven, you have nine? Nine dwarves in your deck? Between the... Are there nine dwarves? Oh, Hypnoscientist is dwarf, isn't it? Yeah, there's the six tunnelers... And there was nine tunnelers between Reese, Hypnoscientist, and Subterrain Spy. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's going to be enabled fairly often. The only thing that's awkward about the Allegiance with that context is that you don't have the Allegiance if it's tunneled. while they are tunneled. Yeah. Oh, that's so weird. That's so weird that, that it does that because if you have a tunneled Reese and you play, and you, and, and, and you, and you play another Reese... It kills the tunneled Reese and vice yep. versa. Correct. See, I, I did that once, not realizing that was going to happen because I figured it would work the same as like suspend and magic, yeah. or or even morph and magic. But and, it does, but it does not. Like that, that really make me wish we had a comprehensive hex rule book. Same. So I didn't have to go to someone and say, "Have you seen this interaction before? How did the game handle it?" <laughs> I would like to be able to look it up and reference it. Yeah. Another interaction uh, where that happened, I posted about it in our Slack chat, was uh, an opponent had played two Thunderfield Seers, which adds draw a card onto to, uh, an action. It's not the same as Wintermoon, because Wintermoon, the uh, draw card triggers when you play it. Correct, um, yep. So I just assumed it was tied to the resolution of the card. So they crackling bolted my troop, and I bounced my own troop, to fizzle the crackling bolt, yeah, and they just like still got everything on the. They just still drew two cards, and I was just like, "What the? And why?" Yep. <laughs> it's just like, "Why?" Yep. Not counted upon resolution. All right. So the next one we have, one that I think is really interesting design space, Primal Essence. So uh, it gives you one one on resources. You gain a charge, and then all of your Primal Essences in all zones gain an additional 1-1. One, one. So they just become 2-2, two, two, and then 3-3, three, three, and then 4-4. Four, four. I, I feel like this card is either completely mediocre or busted beyond belief. Yeah, it seems very... Like, these types of cards are very polarizing, right? Like, City of Traders, Ancient Tomb type cards are just, like, either going to be insane, like City of Traders and Ancient Tomb, or just, like, terrible, like, Uditake... <laughs> or you know just the other cards that just give you more than one resource to to use for the turn i think that so like if you're playing a monocolor deck i feel like you really can only afford to play between four and six like truly colorless shards yep and i don't think that this is better than star sphere i mean or crackling vortex if that... yeah or crackling vortex so yeah, that was that was about my assessment as well, and it really depends. Like, I I, f I feel like if your monocolor deck wants to get ahead on resources, you're probably can play other things like Hex Engine even. Yeah. 
It's definitely interesting design, though. Right, and here so, we have uh, an this next card. I think is my favorite card in the set. I was gonna say here we have an uncommon shard. This is interesting design too. So it's uh, re it's an un it's a an untapped resource that so gives you one one this turn. You gain a charge, and while it's in your hand, you can pay three, discard it to get a threshold of your choice and draw a card. I think this card is very good. I'm looking forward to taking it pretty highly in limited in draft. Um, and I think that it even has potential to see playing constructed. I, I definitely think this card has potential to see playing constructed like a, a three shard uh, control deck that's on, you know, something obnoxious like 27 or 28 shards where four of them are this and I think you're going to be good to go. Yeah, I think that this might even just be better than Star Sphere. Yeah, yeah, and 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 this is basically like I w I would think of this card as a Horizon Canopy style effect that offers that offers fixing. Like yeah, it's a it's a resource when you need it to be a resource or a charge, but it can also just like you know replace itself later, and it offers some fixing in the process. Yeah, I really like this card. And I, I really like that it's an uncommon. So, like, you can potentially have, you know, realistically see them a decent amount of the time in Limited. Yep. I'm longing for the days that they print common resources with utility for, for Limited because I'm a big fan of drafting resource type cards pretty high. All right, so that is it for the. <clears throat> For the base cards in the set, let's go ahead and look at the new champions that we get so that we can see just how awesome they are. So here is the first one, Fiona Honeyfinch. <clears throat> so you're going to start with 25 health, uh, so it's diamond, sapphire, uh, you can pay three charges, and troops without flight get minus one until the start of your next turn. I think this card is trash. Yeah, I, I just <laughs> this not is trash. This ever being better than um, Dreaming Fox. Yeah, like, I would just rather have an Oracle Song win. Get this. <clears throat> now, I might... This might be usable in draft, but it also affects your troops. Yep, so you have to be like heavily in on the flying theme for this yeah. for this champion to even be relevant there. Yeah, no thanks, Miss Honeyfinch. Here we have Kag Kagluichu. So twenty one starting health. It's a wild blood champion, four charges. Put the bottom three cards of your deck into your crypt, reveal a random card from your crypt, and put the revealed card into your hand. So the way that I see this card is at the very least it's just four charges draw a card, but you're in the wild blood threshold. Yep, and it, and, it, and it enables a lot of the cards that, you know, we're looking at in the set that require you to, like, void random troops out of your crypt and stuff along that line, so I think this card, will, this champion will see play in Constructed, and it'll definitely be playable in Limited. Yeah, like, it's gonna be playable in Limited, and it'll just be, I think this is the champion that I'm gonna start with when I try to build the Reanimator deck. Here we have Morgan. All right, well, apparently the image for Morgan McBombus on the Hex TCG website takes me to Bumblebot. <laughs> yep, it definitely does. I'm looking at that now. Yeah, so let's see if I can just move my thing around here. Nope, not going to work. All right, so Morgan McBombus, uh, start at 22. Um, Actually, here, let's just. And there we go. So you start at 22, uh, basic ruby sapphire. If you played an action this turn, you can pay three three charges to create a bumble bot and put it into play. Bumble bot's just the two two flying haste. Uh, one one flying haste. Or one, one one flying haste artifact. I don't think it's good enough. I don't know. I mean, like, so the dwarf champion that occasionally sees play that makes worker bots um 
I feel like this is mostly better than that. Not only because um, the Bumblebot has a little bit steeper of a requirement to get created, but this champion also has three more points of starting health, which is not not irrelevant. Yeah, that's true. I guess if it if it ever gets to a point where like Craghaven is playable again, McBombus is probably just better. Um, McBombus does not have synergy with an untunneled Reese, but other than that, I feel like he's mostly upside compared to the other dwarf champion. Yeah. Alright, so here we have Raven Talon. Uh, green white, start at 24. You pay three charges, and you get when a troop enters play under your control, gain one health this turn. So this is very easily going to be in the green white uh, life gain deck for limited. And if that actually ends up becoming an becoming an archetype and constructed, it might actually be playable there too. Yeah, I'd be surprised if that ends up being a constructed archetype, but I definitely think that a lot of those cards are going to get enabled and limited by this. Yep. And we have Yotul Mogak. So he's the Blood Ruby Champion. Uh, two charges, which I think it's important to note that champions with two like charge powers that only cost two are... You, I, I want to take extra look at them because, like, you're very likely going to get like between three and five activations of this over the course of a game, which is a yep. lot. Well, I guess you got to determine the context of the card too. Like, this is probably a more aggressive champion, so somewhere between two and four is probably more realistic. How many times you're activating this? Uh, well, there are a lot of cards that give you charges. Just okay, the, that's the, fair. The only reason that I would contemplate more. So, like. Uh, you pay two charges, non combat damage dealt by your cards is increased by one this turn. So, like, this works well with, like, the, the red chant that does damage when a constant enters play under your control. Um, like, you could even play the, the blood infusion device to where, like, you get a charge and then you can cash it in when you use his ability to deal four damage because it's non, non combat. Like, I think this, this guy has a lot of potential. Um, like it makes your scorches still too. Like that's that's insane. Yep, not not irrelevant at all. Yeah, maybe you're just like a ruby with a light blood splash for this champion, and just play a phoenix style deck. Yeah, an important thing to know too is that he has more uh, higher starting life total than the other the other aggressive champions like Urgnok and um, Paka. Yeah, nineteen is pretty high. And here's the last one. We have a just a true colorless champion. So this is Uzu the Bone Walker. Uh, it starts at 23, and you can pay four charges, and you gain a threshold of your choice. So this is pretty interesting. Um, you know, I feel like that this is this could just like any deck could use this as their champion. Yeah, I mean the starting the starting health total is not is not terrible. Um, if you're in three shards or more, the fixing's not not negligible. Yeah, and even if you're just playing cards that get benefits when you gain thresholds, um, you know, even if you're just in limited, you know, let's say you just open this bomb rare and you want to splash it, and you just use this as the champion. Like there are, I want to say there are a lot of games <coughs> in draft where just like the champion powers are just completely irrelevant. With how they're like okay. actually affecting the board, and so just like being able to enable some of your cards seems pretty sweet. Um, I don't think that like the five shard decks have a lot of legs in constructed, um, but uh, if there ends up being a deck that's good in constructed, it's using this champion, and the deck is going to be extremely powerful. But I just don't think it's going to happen. One of the neat things about this champion too is that she allows you to splash a third shard into any any two shard deck yeah like you can you can just like play this blood card in my winter moon deck and literally have no blood shards on my deck or sorry not in a winter moon deck winter moon's a champion obviously but like play play a blood card in like a sapphire wild deck and like literally have no blood shards in the deck yeah it will, and it also actually i think the most important aspect of this champion that a lot of people are going to overlook when they first start looking at it is you can use this to turn on gems which is pretty sweet yeah definitely like you um 
I'm blanking on the card, the five cost artifact right now. Um, Eternal Sage. You mm -hmm. can trigger any of Eternal Sage's abilities that are convenient for you with an activation of this. Yeah, and you can turn on gems. So, like, you know, if this is a match where Spell Shield would be great and you're not playing, like, actually playing wild and Uzu's oh, your, your yeah, champion, okay. yep. you can just give yourself a wild threshold and that turns on your Spell Shield gem. Okay. Or That's pretty cool. You, you could, uh, you know, your Borean Root Fathers, you're not playing Diamond, you could put Life Gain on them. Yeah. And that's... that's this, this is a tricky one. I think that there's there's more to meets the eye with Uzu the Bonewalker. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the set review. Uh, thanks so much, guys, for sticking with us and watching the videos. Uh, Jeff, thanks for joining me on the set review. had quite a bit of fun. Uh, for those of you, who, for those of you who uh, aren't aware, um, I am now doing hex content. You can find it on hexprimal.com. Jeff is also doing hex content. Some of it's on hexprimal. Some of it's on the hextcg.com mothership. Uh, we do have some sweet discount codes if you want to uh, purchase some cards or product through hexprimal. You can either use CVM5 uh, or Jeff5 to save a little blood of money there, which is pretty sweet. And uh, this should be going up right before Primal Dawn gets released, and I am super pumped. <laughs> and um, uh, I stream Hex a couple times a week on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv forward slash Jeff Hoagland. Uh, you do a couple times a week as well, right, Steve? Yep, uh, twitch.tv slash Chris underscore Van Meter. So make sure you guys check those out, and they will be in link, – links to all that stuff will be in the descriptions on the video. So uh, hope you guys enjoyed Hex. Hope you guys enjoyed hearing – our insights on it. We have a little bit, a little different background from the majority of the uh, current professional hex players. Uh, so hopefully it can, you know, help you understand the game a little better, understand, you know, how we view the cards a little bit. Maybe even convince you to try the game out. It's completely free to play, uh, and there's some awesome things going on. So thank you so much for watching, and I guess I'll see you in the next piece of content that we do for hex. Peace, folks.